but I had a very small board. I had a board that was made up of a fellow, we were in the lab software business, by the way, laboratory software business, and I had a fellow who came from the lab marketplace. He owned a laboratory company. I had a fellow who came from the investment community who knew, knew his way around that space. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I had a fellow who was a retired partner at a large accounting firm, Ernst & Young, to be specific. And then I added my corporate lawyer to the board and our CFO. And between us, we ran the company. And I can't tell you how important it is that you get along, that you respect each other, and that you operate well together. Um, I think I've said it a thousand times, then, and Roji wanted me to say it again, this is a thousand and ten. Um, it's an old Monty Python joke where Monty Python was saying he had a, uh, I can't remember the one, the Earl of something and the Earl of Sandwich, and he said, give me the Earl of this and the Sandwich and I will rule the world. Well, I have the same perspective, but my perspective is you need a very good lawyer and a good accountant and you can rule the world, okay? The lawyer will keep you out of trouble, the accountant will keep you on track, and that's really important. So, um, having said that, the things you need uh, to look for in the board and the expertise uh, they should have. I want to emphasize again, board members are not there to solve your problems, right? Your operational problems and your day-to-day -day problems are your issues. They're there for sounding boards and for strategic input on how you operate and what you do. They're there to provide you advice, to provide mentorship capabilities to you. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, intuitively, it feels like you want to go ask them questions. Well, you can. And the best way to do that is if you've got someone, in, like in my case, who knew the lab business, I would take him to lunch and we would go talk about a problem. Or if someone in the finance side, <coughs> we were having something to talk about that. So take them aside one on one and, and deal with specific problems. But when you're all together in a board meeting, and Rosie will get into this a little more. You want to be strategic and you want to be high level. Keep things at a high level. Um, there it is. Okay. I got all my notes on these slides. As you can see, there's lots of slides. <laughs> so, um, the, again, I can't overemphasize the board's commitment to your business and to you personally. Um, they often take on the role of mentor. And, what characteristics uh, you should look for, okay? You should look for characteristics that fit your company's needs. These are needs overall strategically in your marketplace, where your plans are, what you want to do, how you want to grow, etc. And find board members that fit that. I've said that already, though. Um, it's good to have committees, and Rosie will talk a little bit about this as well. Uh, committees let you focus activities and they let board members focus activities. Typically in small boards, you don't need a lot of committees, but when the boards get bigger, you do, because, and, and for those of you who serve on nonprofit boards, they typically have 20 members, and if, if you tried to get something done with 20 members, it wouldn't happen. So what we do is we focus on committee structures, we charter the committee, give it a very specific charter of what it's supposed to do, how it's supposed to function, et cetera, et cetera, and how it's supposed to interact with the overall board and then the way it goes. Um, so when you're recruiting board members, um, you need to look for uh, um, here, um, you need to look for the, the kinds of characteristics that fit those needs. And yeah, um, I'm gonna go back one. Sorry, I didn't get to that one. <laughs> Integrity. Make sure there are no conflicts. Uh, again, if, if you have somebody on your board who um, who is literally doing it for the money, or doing it for the equity, or whatever, that's a very bad situation. Um, that person could actually destroy your whole company. So be careful that when you you vet people, and you vet them very carefully, that they don't have a conflict of interest, and that they're not in any way, shape, or form doing this for the money, the exposure, to help their son's business, or their uncle's business, or a friend's business, or whatever, okay? Just make sure that there's no conflicts. And that's easy enough to find out. And if you're looking for people with um, related experience, always good to find people with related experience. We talked about that. Um, OK, 
connections. Um, so many of us, when we start our businesses, and I started mine with literally money from selling homes, we sold sold the house and used that to fund my company. But very soon after that, I realized we, we needed to get to the next level, and we wound up winding up going public, which probably wasn't a good idea at the time, but it, it, it worked. And what it did is it, it gave us a lot of money. And, um, and it also brought in a director. Now, I was very lucky in that respect that I got a good, a good director. So um, the ability to raise money is, is, um, is a very key characteristic of a board member. And that is somebody who's been involved and done it before, or been involved with companies that have done it before, or maybe even been a board member on a company that did it before, or did it themselves. And that's, uh, uh, again, I, I want to say that's a, a, a good quality and characteristics to, to have. Um, who not to select? I went through this now. You, um, you, you say you don't want to, uh, you shouldn't have someone with a, 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 a friend, a relative, etc. But that's not to exclude friends or relatives. If they meet your criteria and your character and your qualities that you're looking for, um, they really should be fine, okay? And, and this is where you, as the ultimate gatekeeper, are going to have to do the vetting and, the, and, the, and, and basically choose, and choose the people. I want to back up and, and talk about something. I, I, I personally am a fan of NCIS, <laughs> and my wife is now, too, who's sitting back there. Um, if you've watched the program, Leroy Jethro, Jethro Gibbs is all about follow your gut. And I can tell you that's true, okay? If your gut is telling you this doesn't feel right or this doesn't feel good for whatever reason, stop, okay? And especially if you're choosing a board member. If there's something about this person that you're not comfortable with, stop and figure out what it is, okay? And if you can figure out what it is and deal with it, that's great. And, and if not, move on, okay? You don't want someone who you can't relate to at a personal level, a friendship level, and I talked about trust and integrity, okay? And, um, and, and I will say also, having run a company for as long as I've run it, that, um, that it's, it's good to trust your gut, okay? The gut tells you things that you, you don't hear or see, but you, they're there. Okay. Um, Creating a diverse board, it, this is important, and, and the reason it's important is because we live our lives and we live through our experience levels, but we don't live through other people's experiences unless you bring them in. And so having someone older, having someone younger, having someone with a different background, having someone with a different perspective is really good to have, and especially if it's a good working board and you all work together. I'll give you some examples. My board that I had for years and years and years, we could have the most frank conversations you could ever dream of having. I mean, the old cone of silence in that movie, we forget the movie, whatever it was, um, we lived that one. I mean, we could say anything in that board meeting to each other about anything and then get a counter opinion or get a different view of it. And all of us were very much open to the other person's view because we respected them. And, and it's all about respect, okay? and we respected their point of view. But if you bring a diverse board in and, and you meet all these other criteria, you would be amazed at the quality of the different viewpoints that you'll gain and you'll see and the different perspectives. Um, now, having said that, you're going to have a group of people in the room who may have different opinions, okay? And now you're, you are, I don't want to say the referee, but you're going to manage how these opinions get melded into a direction or a strategic strategy. And uh, Rosie will talk a little bit about how to manage that in, a, in, a, in an environment. But at, in, at the end of the day, if you, everybody needs to be an adult. Okay? And I, I like to use that phrase. And I like to use that phrase around hiring employees. And when I give somebody a reference as an employee, I can speak to them as being an adult. I said, there, I just gave one the other day for someone who who I worked with and worked for me in another location, another place. And long story short, I, I, I kind of concluded, I said, this person is an adult. I said, they deal with things in an adult fashion. And, and I felt like I had long I said, I get it. I understand. <laughs> so think about your, your board members as behaving like adults and, and, and throughout. 
and then you'll be able to, to manage those situations. Um, here, okay. Okay, always be looking for new members, for new potential board members. And, um, and that's, I can't tell you how many reasons that is. Your, your business is gonna change, it's gonna grow, it's gonna evolve, you're gonna see different opportunities coming along. Um, and I'll give you an example. I started my company as a computer company, we morphed it into a software company, and we found opportunities in the, in the blood banking, if you will, laboratory software environment. And during the course of our development, as I said, we went public in that process, I made a number of acquisitions. And I acquired two companies in lab space, uh, one doing lab quality control, and we immediately did a contract with Johnson & Johnson. Well, we didn't want anybody from Johnson & Johnson. Well, it turned out my, my lab person on my board did. And so he connected right up to them, and boy, we had a great one-on-one -on -one personal connection to Johnson & Johnson. Now, think about that. Johnson & Johnson, you get in the door, how do you get a personal connection with somebody, right? We did it through a board member. Um, the other one uh, we did, it was an opportunity, we, the third one we did, was an opportunity outside of the laboratory space. Um, this was during managed care, and we had the capability, if you will, to do um, eligibility pre-authorization and referral, and so we basically acquired a company that was in the physician practice management space, brought it in, added a whole bunch of technology on the front end to allow physicians that were using that software to do eligibility pre-authorization and referral, and, and way ahead of its time, and we were connected online to Regents and you know all these other uh, insurance companies doing all this interactive stuff. Well, after a while, it became clear that you know this really probably is not the direction we should be going. And as the grace of God, a fellow approached me and said, "Hey, I'd like to buy that division." I said, "Really? Okay." So we <laughs> sold that division off and refocused ourselves back on our blood bank and lab software which now we took international, we took that international. But the fact of the matter is, is that things change, okay? And business opportunities change. And the point is, you don't know what they are. They're gonna come and they're gonna go and you're gonna have to adjust and, and move on. So, um, okay, so again, and looking for different competencies. Another, another point that, that I'd like to make here in, in, in building the board and looking for new members, advisory boards are excellent as well, okay? And there's a difference between an advisory board, and you're gonna, you're gonna talk about this? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. So there's a difference between an advisory board and a, and a fiduciary board, if you will. A fiduciary board has a fiduciary responsibility to the company. Advisory board is a group of mentors for you as the CEO, okay? And they are available for one-on-one, -on -one, for whatever you need, and what you do, you select them based on what your needs are. And they bring specific expertise beyond like, maybe what you have on your board. Because you don't want to overdo it with a board member who's got um, domain knowledge, let's say. And you can bring two or three others from, from the industry segment that you're involved in. Or, or, or there may be remote people that you, you deal with on the phone or you met at a trade show. Or, you know, however that works when you're networking and out and about. And then you can build an advisory board that can help you... Um, <clears throat> basically handle those operational questions that you may run into, that you don't want to burden the board with, um, but you can get these operational questions answered. And, and a lot of times your, your um, advisory board members have been there, done that kind of thing, so you, you move on with them. Um, okay, and this is really, I, probably the single most important message is to make a personal commitment to your board members and make a personal connection. Because if you don't trust them and believe them and they don't trust you and believe you, think about what that would mean, okay? I mean, they have to trust you, they have to believe in you, you have to trust them and you have to believe in them. Because the advice that you're gonna share is, is big time stuff, okay? It's big stuff. You're talking strategic, you're talking about corporate direction, you're talking about plans that will probably run for years. So it's really important to make that personal investment. And um, again, uh, it's, it's simple. They're people, we're people. Go do people things with them. If they like to play golf, play golf. If they like to go to sports events, go to sports events. If they like to do whatever, go do whatever. Okay? Uh, fashion shows, you, you, you name it, whatever it is. 
go do it with them and build that personal rapport so that that you both know that when you're talking to each other, it's straight. You're straight arrows. Okay, that's really important. Um, what else? <laughs> oh, those are two things. <laughs> Surprise. Okay, takeaways. Um, uh, be strategic about your choices, okay? Um, is it an advisory board or a formal board of directors? So you meet a candidate. What's the difference between somebody who you want as an advisor on an advisory board or somebody who you want as a fiduciary on your, on your board? That's an interesting question. And to me, that question is somebody that has a little more complete experience around the business would be someone I would want on my fiduciary board. Someone who may have been a CEO, who did some of the things I'm trying to do or I want to do would be the one I might want on this board. Someone more tactical and maybe even at a, a, a strategic VP level in a company would be more of an advisor on an advisory board. You see how that works, the difference there? That's that's kind of what I would use as, a, as the, the gating factor, if you will, for fiduciary versus uh, advisor. Um, be clear on your needs, okay? Um, and, and this is not something you, I mean, this is something you sit down and you really, if you already have two board members, you, you noodle it out with them. What is it we need on this board? If you've got four board members, what else do we need on this board, okay? And be very clear when you're vetting somebody about this is what we need and this is why we want you. Okay? This is the expertise we want you to bring. And say it, okay? I mean, say it, be straight out. Um, manage on every, everyone's time and, and uh, uh, talent efficiently and effectively, obviously, that goes without saying. Um, these are almost always, or will be, not almost always, will always be accomplished people. and. Probably don't stand for inefficiencies, lollygagging, excuses. Okay, you've all heard about excuses, and they're not. You don't want any of that with them. Okay, and be very careful about how you manage that talent, um, and then um, open and honest in all respects. If something was wrong, and somebody screwed something up, be very open and honest about it. How it happened. And then what you're going to do about it, okay? How that's not going to happen again. And be very careful about being honest about that. Don't make excuses, as I said. And remember, you're hurting super smart, powerful cats, or even squirrels, or what were we saying? Goats? Or what were we saying? Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. But anyway, um, and that's, what, that's, that's kind of what, what you're looking at doing. We'll have Q&A here at, after Rosie goes, and I made it in 20 minutes. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. It's, it's just an honor to be here, both with John and with, Seth, uh, with this group. Um, I'm just pleased to be here, and I'm looking forward to meeting each one, one of you as soon as we can do that. Um, um, my thing is more on the a little bit more tactical, uh, and how do you manage these cats, and how do you be efficient. What does that mean? And what does it mean to be effective and useful of your time? So we're calling it how to manage board meetings. I'm not making the distinction between an advisory board as much as it, and a directorate, more about the board itself, whichever one it is for you. So um, our philosophy beginning this discussion was think of the board as an ex extension of your team. So uh, you have a team, you're building up your staff, so on and so forth, and you're going to have gaps in that because you can't afford to buy a whole PhD in XYZ, whatever that is. And so think about your team and identify what gaps you have. You will have gaps. <laughs> and try to fill your board with people who can help you build an entire team together. At the same time, they're helping you uh, grow the business and mature the business into a long-term uh, enterprise. And so now that you have your board selected, you know if they're advisors or directors, how are you going to work with them toward your vision? This is all about you. Um, and it's your job. You are the only one who can manage your board. You are the only one who can get what you need out of that board. So that's why this is important. And uh, um, it should take about 10 to 20% of your time. So each of you are working. 90 hours a week, so nine hours a year a week are going to be working with your board. Under 
seven hours, <laughs> ten hours, that's where it's going to be. Um, in preparation for this talk, I interviewed six of my dear friends who gave me an excuse to call them and say, you've been a CEO, you've been on boards, you've been the chairman of the board, what are your best practices? Guess what kind of alignment I had between these styles? Not much. <laughs> Lots of different ways in which this works. It depends on you, your style, the business you want to create, the culture you want to create, the group. So managing this is your job. And your leadership is critical. You've got a company to run, you've got a board to run. And the board is helping you uh, get started on building your enterprise. So you have your staff, you've got organizational stuff <coughs> over here, get a little closer. Yeah. Like, like that, is that better? Oh, it's not working. <laughs> I didn't press it. It was her. I didn't know. Is that, is that better? I'll check batteries. Go ahead and continue, and I'll see if it's this. Um, uh, so in your company, uh, as it grows, and as you keep adding people, and you're going to be adding structure, you're adding systems, you're adding skills, and you're the ones inside who are doing your plans, your strategic plans, your budget plan, and so on. But your board are always thinking bigger picture. They should be always thinking strategically. They're always, oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Back again. Um, they're thinking strategically. They're thinking about the industry three to five years from now, 10 years from now, based on the experience that they have. And you want to take advantage of that. You also think about the experiences that your board has. If we went around this room right now and added the number of decades of experience in this room, it's pretty amazing what you can put on a board, both the resource map that you put together with your board and the experience that you put together with your board. So it's a powerful, powerful thing to, for you to do in, in growing your business. Of course, there's knowledge, networks, insights, and advice. So the key thing here is knowing what you need. Uh, know thy own gaps. Mm -hmm. Take the blinders off. Have someone help you, perhaps. Be objective. Take the blinders off. Be very clear, honest about what you have and what you're missing. Because that's how you fill your board completely, to have a full vision thing. Um, it's very high leverage. Very high leverage for you and for your staff. So um, we want to do it well. So why would we have a board meeting? Do we need a meeting or can you just meet people one on one and then collect all their ideas and put them together and make up your own decision? Well, there are differences between having a group meeting and the discussions that occur and the decisions that come out of that versus one on one. So you have a whole bunch of one on ones, put them, try to add them together, but you don't get the same thing you get when you have a group meeting. So you know, we don't think yeah, meetings are boring, but you can't help but um, have the discursive conversations that occur um, after a thought. Because you get insights from that diverse experience. And, um, and I want to make a pitch for having at least two women on your board. Um, the, the approach is different, the experiences are different, and you're going to get so much more um, unexplainable value out of having at least two in one board. No matter how big your board is, have at least two. So if you have two on your board, they're both women. Um, <laughs> that'd be awesome. Um, the purpose of that is the wide range of discussions, wide range of experience you get. Uh, and we've shown over and over again that groups do end up making, more often, make better decisions. Great teams make better decisions faster, but at least a group makes better decisions. So uh, you benefit from the collective considerations that only come out of a group discussion. And what that implies then is that you've got to manage group discussions. And so we'll talk about that here in a bit. Um, and so your role uh, is to ensure diversity, encourage deep discussion. There can be some critical conversations and so Back to John's point about know people personally so you can have those 
uncomfortable discussions. Um, and the uncomfortable conversations are sometimes the most valuable because they're, they're something you really didn't want to approach or something that was in a blind spot for you. So it's your job to lead the group to a collective and useful conclusion. And recognize the power in your role, difficult though it may be. And there's a lot of styles of facilitation in group discussions, uh, different ways to run a meeting. This, is, this was one in which the CEO needed to be at the table, not in front of the table. And so he asked me to come and facilitate as a, as a not subject matter expert, if you would, so that he could be just part of the discussion. So I facilitated this meeting, and I had, I had an agenda, but I also knew when we were off track. And I could pull people back on track or do whatever, because they could fire me. They couldn't fire the CEO. So, um, so anyway, that's, that's one style. Sometimes you need someone besides yourself to run the meeting. And um, this is the way not to do a board meeting. Um, and I this is a good friend of mine. But all he did was load them up with information and never ask them to do anything. And so three or four of the board members quit. If you're not going to do anything, then we're out of there. These pictures look much better on there. Um, but get to know them informally as, um, as individuals. Wine does help. Um, but as John said, if they golf, go golfing. So managing a board is like herding cats, more like lions. Um, because you, you're filling the board with people who have deep experience, they've done this before, they've, had, they've built businesses, so they are high D, they're, they don't take much crap from anybody, um, and uh, you have to make these meetings efficient for you, effective for yourself. You need to get out of the meetings what you need to get out of them, but they have to be efficient for them. As John said, no excuses, no BS, uh, just get on with it. So leverage them wisely. Um, so how do you do that? Be sure you ask for what you need and ask it clearly. If you um, be efficient using their time and effective when using their guidance. <laughs> if they give you input, be sure to acknowledge it. Let them know if you're going to use it or not. So there's that. There's got to be a, a thing. The, the other thing about meetings, just real quick, is that um, the board members always like to interact with each other, and so find a way in which that networking can occur outside the meeting. Sometimes you set that aside as a, a at dinner the night before. It's a great way to allow people to get to know each other. That way they've got that personal relationship, trust and respect between board members, especially if you're growing a board. There's also sometimes individual issues that come up. Um, remember one board where there was one gentleman who would wait to the end of the meeting and then describe how terrible it was. Um, and so taking him aside and saying that wasn't very helpful, I had to do that outside the meeting. <clears throat> so three phases of managing your board meeting. Preparation is everything. Then conducting the meeting, how do we do that? And then follow through. All of those, much of the task within these three phases can be outsourced. So you can, you can bring people in to be your scribe, your timekeeper, uh, logistics, do all that work, outsource what you can. You still have a lot of work to do. So in preparation, preparation uh, read your bylaws beforehand. If you have bylaws, if you don't, um, think about the guidance, the way in which your business is gonna grow, and think about how you want to conduct this meeting that is evidence of your future business. Um, find the top issues you want the board to work on. What must you tell them? Tell them and then stop. Um, and find out what you need help with. And be really, really clear about those top issues. If you want them just to brainstorm and tell you what's going to work, what's not going to work, if you want them to just have a discussion, or if you want a decision, let them know what level of uh, conversation you need to have them have. The worst thing is to have them think that you're you want a decision and you really didn't. Um, it just <laughs> takes you off sideways. And then call everybody ahead of time. Let them know what your top topics are gonna be because you want them to be prepared. 
You want them to know what to expect, especially if the topic is in their wheelhouse. And avoid surprises. Don't walk in and tell somebody you just fired one of the staff members because this world is too small. They will find out somehow. And uh, so don't surprise them. Ruins trust. And then conducting the meeting. Um, you know, set the roadmap. Follow rules of collaboration. I think if you don't know those, we can share them. Um, encourage everybody to participate. Uh, I like the sports analogy for conversations. One is, you know, the, the bowling alley. If you're at the bowling ball, you're just throwing information out there. That's one style of communication. The other is a tennis game, where it's a dialogue. The next is a basketball, where the conversation goes to one person, which goes to another person, comes back here. And the last type is rugby, <laughs> where all hands on deck, everybody <laughs> talking at once. So figure out which kind is going on right then and which one is the correct, correct analogy for you at the time. Um, a parking lot allows you to put topics that are off topic someplace they know it's going to get addressed at a later time. And hold members accountable. They do want to help you, and they want to know that you care enough to attract them. Um, closing is, I have this thing called a closing ceremony. It's a 10-minute thing at the end of any meeting. <coughs> and I say, this is what I heard us say today. And be real clear about, this is the decision I heard us make. Make sure that everybody hears it. And then identify the communication plan that's going to happen after the meeting. Who's going to tell the executive staff? How soon will they know? Tell me exactly what you're going to say to them. And follow through. So update the executive staff afterwards. They're probably sitting right outside the boardroom room door or outside the bathroom uh, trying to identify what you said, what decision did you make. So let them know right away and uh, uh, identify the actions that have to take place. Review that with your team, see if it's going to fit in your budget. Um, and, um, and then minutes within, should be sent out within 48 hours. Um, sometimes things need to be in your notes, uh, especially about disagreements or people who have varying opinions, whatever you want to keep track of that might not go in public meetings, or in the minutes, I mean polished minutes. And then we're, make the members work as easy as possible. And the key is sustain these relationships between the meetings. So the meetings aren't everything. You gotta keep working between the meetings. So um, takeaways, be very clear about your requests. If you need something from the board, be clear about what it is, uh, what you expect back from them, whether you, uh, the decision is made or, um, or just input. Manage everyone's time, as John said. Be open and honest about everything. Uh, transparency, as Cindy. Uh, and, uh, and keep that honesty and openness throughout the relationships. Um, one of the CEOs mentioned the leverage in a board meeting. If you've got a project going on that doesn't, just doesn't feel like it's going well, there's nothing like saying you're gonna make a present to this project manager, you're gonna make a presentation at the board meeting. All of a sudden, things happen. So two things about a board meeting, it's great leverage. It also allows the board members to see the staff in, in real life. So it gives, the, gives some exposure to the board members of the staff as well. Um, so meetings have to matter. So um, this is a list of our resource materials. And if you, if you think, they'll get, think they'll get this in PowerPoint, so those read mores will link out to um, some of our references. And um, with that, I'll open up for questions. Actually, we're looking for answers, too. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
So I, I guess, uh, let me take a shot here. Um, I would ask how many founders are on the board? So are you talking two, five, eight, one? Well, we're talking a board of three with two founders. Three with two founders. Then, then you need to obviously sit down and examine, as we've said, what, what are our needs? What do we need this board to have and to do? And this founder brings this expertise, this one brings this expertise, this one brings this, but by the way, we have holes here and here and here. We should go out and recruit this. And get agreement. Assuming you have resources with which to do that. Um, that's not easy. You're exactly right. That's not easy. So, so if the CEO, one one of those founders is going to be the CEO, I would assume. No, I'm the CEO. Uh, well, I'm the non-founder CEO. Oh, okay. So you came in as CEO. Okay. Well, that's probably even better because now you've brought an outside perspective into the into the picture, and now you can you theoretically be not as biased or partisan as they would be as founders. And now you can come back and say, we need this, this, and this. If we want to look like this in two years and this in five years, this is what we need to have in place and get them to agree. If they don't agree, you're right, that's tough. It ain't gonna happen. So, so that's where you get back to trust, integrity, and those kinds of things I talked about earlier. If, if, if that group doesn't trust each other and doesn't have the quote unquote integrity to deal with each other, it's probably that ain't gonna work. So. But I think that's just gonna be a classic of probably most of the companies that are in this room. So still have the founder run businesses at this point. Mm -hmm. And it's not a matter of trust amongst the founders, but a matter of a perspective on where a board and a business has to be outside of the realm or the experience base of the founders. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and let me add one more thing to that, is that you don't necessarily need to go out and get a full-on board in your first example. You could get an advisory board or advisors to come in and, and, and basically sell them on, you know, we need help in this area, and there are people out there that have done this, why don't we recruit somebody to come and help us, right? And do the advisory board piece if they're not ready to do the full-on board. Oh, I'm sorry, we had to. Well, I just wanted to go off of that, too, and just figuring out the timing. You know, we're still small and more and seeing how much time it is to manage them and use their time well. When is it worth trying to build a board or just get the advisory board? And when is it just too much time and you see it's too early to have? Your CEO? Yeah. There's no such thing as time. Yeah. <laughs> Throw the clock away. Okay. Well, I think it also makes a difference as to what kind of company you are. So if you are a C Corp, you actually have to have a board. Yeah. If you're if you're an LLC, you don't have to worry about that stuff. But once you become an actual C corp, particularly if you're like a, you know, we we converted to Delaware C corp because we're interested in um, raising equity finance. Um, and so one of the steps you have to do is actually become a C corp in a state that most investors will be comfortable with, which means that 90 plus percent are going to be Delaware C corp. Um, Oregon C Corp doesn't really fly very well. <laughs> but the, uh, the, the issue I was going to raise is that, <clears throat> to your point about selection, you know, the board uh, represents particular shareholders. So when you start getting shareholders to go and invest in the business, VCs and others, you have people on the board that you do not select. And so it's the issue of you know having to work with those people that you're not selecting. Did everybody hear that? <laughs> we're, we're, we're talking about um, when you take money from from outside investors, there's a very high likelihood they're going to want to have their finger on the pulse of the company, make sure their money is being efficiently used, okay? and they will want to put board members on. It's not. This is where I come back to. You better have a good lawyer, okay? Because that lawyer is going to write that agreement, that, that investment agreement, if you will. And what you want to be have in there is to make sure that you have the opportunity to vet any board members that are coming in and that they, that they, they need to be qualified to, to be on the board. And it's just not the, not the, in, the investment bank's brother-in-law. That, that doesn't work, okay? Somebody who, can, who actually brings something to the party. So, and it can, be, it can be very tricky. And we've all heard the horror stories. Of, of that. And I come back to my personal experience. I got very lucky 
and had an investment from Allen and Company in New York, if you know the group, and, and they put a fellow who they wanted to put on the board who's become a lifelong personal friend, and he was great. He was absolutely great. So I got very lucky, right? And it doesn't always work that way. So be careful. Yep. There are agencies out there that try to select individuals who wish to be on boards with uh, companies that are looking for board members. Would you personally recommend either side for that? I'm not familiar with any of that. Okay. So, are you familiar with that? No. Are you getting the email? I've seen them. I was approached. And, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. They're out there surfing yeah. all the time. They're looking. How would you like to to be on a board? Oh. What I and I'm like. Yeah. So they're going to solicit and see if they can find out. I'm sure they found a way to make some money off of this. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, there are executive search firms that also specialize yeah. in retreat board right. members, but right. most of those are going to be pretty legitimate in finding the people with the right expertise. Yeah. But in terms of Miguel's question about the board being members coming from the VCs, well, this is precisely why you go after what we call smart money. These are going to be companies that specialize in this area because venture capitalists don't select another person, right. whoever partner was the lead on that investment was going to be the person on the board. Right. So the reason you get these guys who've got a lot of experience in the industry is that they're the ones who are going to be able to connect you with other money, um, potential partners. So John made some examples of you know, the clinics in J&J. Well, if you get the right kind of venture money, you're going to get those types of people on your board because it's in their best interest for you to find a good exit. That's the only way they make their money. Or you don't take the money. <laughs> yeah. Well, sometimes you don't have a choice. I mean, I've been through plenty of companies where you didn't really have a choice because the only money they could find was from other sources. And, and then there's a credit. Yeah. Well, yeah, but they survived. That was their main mode. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about board compensation? So, particularly for a small company, maybe doesn't have a lot of resources, maybe isn't planning on going public anytime soon. How do you make it worth somebody's while? Well, having been on a number of startup boards, it was always an equity piece. Yeah. Never got paid cash because didn't have any. And um, very few of those work out. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, typically what happens is, is the board will get together and decide what percentage of the equity they want to allocate to board members and to employees and staff, right? And the percentage varies, okay, it varies. Um, could be as high as 10% in that bucket, I would say. And, uh, and then you've got to look at dilution clauses, you know, if you go out and raise money, what happens to that? Again, this is where you want the good lawyer, the lawyer who's done this before, right? And they can give you a perspective on not just their experience, but other clients they've had and whatever and what they know. And you know, it, it, it kind of varies. It varies on the risk characteristics of the organization. Um, it varies based on the experience level of the founders, if you will. People will look at it and go, what's the likelihood of this organization making it? Should I waste my time? Should I not? You know, that kind of thing. I mean, that's the thought, the question that the board member is asking themselves, okay? Because they get a lot of requests to be on boards and, and they want to know what is it, what's the likelihood of success. But they're not doing it for the money, okay? They're just not doing it for the money. They do it because they believe in the company, believe in what they're doing, believe in the founders, et cetera. And, um, and, and then the percentages change. They, again, having run a public company, we had a pool and we would, the board would vote on it, how much we would put in that pool for, for staff, basically. And, and directors, and it was it was staff directors. This is the way it worked. Staff directors. Okay, the staff got a lot of it. The director didn't get so much. So, you want to add to that? Okay. Yeah, I, I mostly the nonprofit boards and stuff. Nobody ever gets to do We're doing this for the bigger picture, doing it for the betterment of some larger story that we can all do as a group. So, I can help you do that. And initially, these were all nonprofits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bill. Yeah, John, um, from Rosie, do you see any conflicts between the type of board you might want as CEO to help you build and grow your company and an investor who says, now, because I invested, I'm an owner of the company, I want the company to be managed for the benefit of the owners? 
Well, uh, yes. <laughs> At the end of the day, um, when you choose an investor, you need to be you need to be careful. Okay, what kind of investor are you choosing? If you're choosing somebody who gets in and flips their their ownership, um, you, you may not want that one. Okay. Now, if you want to get flipped, that's a different story. But if you're looking at somebody who, to, uh, I forgot your name. Doug. <laughs> Doug Smart Money. Um, the Smart Money investors are going to stick for the long haul because they know there's a long range, bigger win down the road, and they're, they're in for the long run, if you will. And so looking for those kind of investors is obviously better than looking for someone who maybe doesn't know your industry or a friends and family kind of thing that things may change and they want out, they want to get liquidated somehow, um, you know, so, and that can create friction too. I mean, you can get pressure from a minority shareholder who's being a real pain in the neck that, you know, hey, we got to flip this thing, we got to get out, we got to get our money out, you know, whatever. So yes, this is all part of the selection process and, 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 and looking for, as Doug said, look for smart money, okay? When you get smart money, smart money's in for a longer term. They understand what you're doing. They can also provide you access and resource to others in that space, okay? Not necessarily, so, so if you got a, a, an investment from ABC Capital, if you will, and ABC Capital didn't have somebody they wanted to put on the board, but they knew someone who thought, you know, here's three people, choose one of these folks for your board, and that, investment, if you will, would be from their point of money and from their other point, they're putting someone in there who they trust will do a good job at helping you manage the company. Okay? And that's another way of looking at it, is, is getting help from them. So, not just, I mean, talking about searching and finding people, yes. And, and the question is, you know, who, who do we have? I mean, here's Bill right here, and he's, he knows his way around the investment community in town and knows who might be a good board member for you or get out and network and meet people and see who's a good board member for you. There you go, okay, from there. Okay. Is there a limit number right. of board sure. members? I'm sorry? Limited number? Is there, there, number of is there a limit, limit number, number of board members? I, I don't know of any limit. Yeah. No. no. Um, Probably. Common sense is your limit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How much time do you have to? Well, yeah, that's, that's you know, reason the articles of the bylaws. The article of bylaws uh, is true. Yeah. The minimum or the maximum. You get to number. change those numbers. I think yeah. my role would probably be the two or the better, yeah. as long as you can get the job done. Uh, and I right. agree 100%. And as I said in my example, I had three outside directors, a lawyer, and, a, uh, and my CFO, and that was it. And, and we got a lot done. I mean, we did it in a very cohesive, uh, if you will, constructive way. Okay. If, I think if you can build that entirety of the knowledge and resources that you need, smaller uh, and yes. it's cohesive also to what you want to do with your business. Now, I, I want to back up, we, we didn't touch on this. Having a compensation committee on the board is, is a very good thing, <laughs> having your bylaws too, mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, that will set your compensation, okay? Um, and they will set your compensation. In my, in my personal case, is I never made any efforts I, I have a personal philosophy, and that is I wouldn't take anything from my business that I wouldn't make sure my staff had. Okay, so anything that I got, I made sure they all had. And I never tried to get a raise or tried to get a lot of money, I never did that. And, and it was my board who came to me and said, you're not making enough money, we gotta give you more money. And I went, oh, okay. So, <laughs> but, but that's the kind of board you want, right? That's the kind of board you want to have working with you. Well, hang on one second, we don't want to get first. Yes, sir. On one of your slides, you effectively had a board member on your shoulder. How do you do that for yourself? Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, thank you. I forgot to mention that. Okay, so that's your, your, your uh, what, what do they call it? The virtual, 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 virtual board member, yeah. So that's your your your, uh, your John Wayne, your, you know, Hubble on Cassidy, your whoever, or whoever, your Wonder Woman. Yeah. The, 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 the person that you come in at something in a meeting and you say, what would they do, all right? Most likely, shut up and listen. <laughs> That's the best thing to do, no matter what. Shut up and listen, okay? And get to the root of what the question or the issue is, and then you can come back and deal with it, okay? And, and always think about that person. If they're on your shoulder, what would they say to you? They'd smack you in the head and say, shut up, and then try this, right? So, and I don't know whoever you kind of look up to to, 
that to do that. But that's yes. Do you think that uh, companies that have the traditional board structures that you're describing are more apt to attract angel and family office investors prior to even the VCs are really that, that interested in what they're doing to finance? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Do, do you think that the companies that have the traditional board structures that you're describing are more apt to get financing prior to VC financing, like from VCs and family offices, or excuse me, like from angel investors and family offices? You know, I, I would submit that, you know, having a good corporate structure and having a good company structure just says you've got your act together. And if you have your act together, you're most likely going to get funded. If it looks like you don't have your act together, you may not. So it can't hurt to have a good, good set of bylaws. It can't hurt to have a good corporate structure, capital structure, and, and, a, and a vision to where it's going and how it's going to get there. And, you know, how you compensate people and how they're involved. I mean, it's a good idea to have all that pulled together. Yes, no question. If you, I mean, you're walking into a, 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 any sort of investor and looking like you're, I don't want to use bad words, you don't have your act together, uh, it ain't gonna fly, right? But it's, it doesn't fly, so, yeah. So in the past, it, it would be the board that would run the company, CEO is one position, CEO would run the company and be a member of the board. Fiduciary speaking, that was the way it was done. More recently, CEOs have kind of all the power. They give themselves more voting rights and they appoint the board. So it's really the CEO that runs everything. Do you have a preference and do you, do you advise CEOs to try to run everything? Um, have you guys heard that? Is that? What I heard you say is that <clears throat> there are organizations where the CEO um, basically has evolved to the place where they run the whole show. One is like Snapchat, where I'm sorry, like, one is like Snapchat, where shareholders can't even vote. Oh, yeah, yeah well, is that, or is yeah. that what you're speaking to, Tony? Uh, or Facebook, I mean, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Um, did you invest in that company early on? That's not the question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that, no, that tells a lot. That says a lot because at the end of the day, we trust them. You know, you're putting all the trust into one person. That's that. If you trust them, yeah, fine, it's okay, that works. I, I, I personally don't like that idea, no. Uh, that's not my way of doing things. And, um, you know, I, I truly believe you need, you, need a various, you need various inputs and they need to have a, a sense of, I can influence the outcome. If they get on a board and they feel like they can't influence the outcome, why would you be on the board? Yeah. Right? And so who, what kind of members will that board have? Right? I think it's an interesting um, point in the history of capitalism that, that we are allowing that to happen. And I, I'm fascinated by it, so appreciate your thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Actually if, I may, if I may make a point, uh, in the UK, by law, public companies have to have a chairman that is not the CEO. Oh, okay. The chairman of the board in UK companies cannot be the CEO. So you have some somebody that no. is independent that is not executive that is actually running the board but the board doesn't actually run the company no and that's now that's actually that's never really been the case no but what the boards often do is they give the list of things to do to the ceo yeah. so i know some former ceos that said that you know they don't want to be ceo anymore what they want to be is on the board so they're the ones who make the list <laughs> <laughs> so well, the boards are not the rest of the operation of and theoretically, the way the system is set up is you have the shareholders, they elect the board. Right. And then the board basically figures out who, what, and where, and they got a theoretically an HR committee slant that figures out who the CEO is, and the board can fire the CEO, theoretically. Right? If you have a structure that doesn't work like that, um, that, that doesn't work for me. So. Well, in, in the same temper of running a board meeting, um, we put the word questions up here, but look at the experience around the room. So are there some best practices that you would like to share with this group? Anybody want to add something that you've learned through time that's really worked well for you that you'd like to share with this group? Well, I think it's yeah. important that the CEO actually run, in spite of having a chairman, the CEO should actually be the one who runs that board meeting. And, it's, and if you really want to have things move smoothly, you pretty much have to take charge of everything that goes on the agenda and 
line up the meeting and have it all prepped. Um, so you have to run it like any other meeting where you're either the facilitator or the leader, but you keep it directed and moving in a certain direction. Otherwise, you're, you're not going to get accomplished what you need to get accomplished from quarter to quarter or however yet often you have your board meetings. Um, you're going to find that you're not getting what you need to get done to progress the business. So, all right. Okay. Think about what you need right now and to help you work that through. And, and I would add to that that the CEO is really reflecting the strategic umbrella that's over the organization. And so, and, and I mean, if you don't do this, do it. I do it every year. Have a strategic plan. Have a strategic planning meeting every year and look at what you're going to do next year, okay? Now, you're exactly right. The CEO now manages to that strategic plan going forward, mm -hmm. okay? But if you don't have that overall strategic plan, you know. And I would, you know, I would put forth that the board is a forum where you have the multiple interests of the company coming together. Yeah. And you have the, the interests of the shareholders, you have the interests of the management team, <coughs> In Europe, you even have the interest of the workers because the workers are represented on the board. That's so, true. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so having somebody that is the chairman and that is not does not does not represent any of the interests because the CEO really represents the interests mostly of the management team. So I, I'll share this with you. I created this 25 years ago and shared it with my clients over the years, <clears throat> but we live on a three-legged stool, okay? And the three-legged stool, and I picture of a three-legged stool with the customer, the employee, and the owner. And we balance their interest on that stool, okay? And we had that, as a mantra, we had those around the office, <laughs> literally, with our, with who we were, a mission statement of who we were, and quote-unquote, we called it our way, and the way we did things. Okay, respectful of each other, blah, 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 blah. And those were posted around the office as well. So if you have 75 people, and to keep 75 people on the same page, you know, it's not easy. So, and doing little things like that make a huge difference. And if you do it from day one, everybody gets it right away, and it grows. It grows with the organization. Mm -hmm. Do they have three, uh, you said it in the investment. I'm sorry, one more time. They have three employees, and also the owners. Yeah. Where do you put the investment? Who? For, for the investors. Owners. Oh, they're owners. Yeah. So, my experience is everything yeah. Owners, employees, customers. Doesn't exist without those three. So, the investors are part of the and, in, and their interests need to be balanced. Always. Your, your job as a CEO is to balance those interests. So the response to Don's question, I think since the board is not the operational component of the business, investors are going to be more interested in whether or not you have a management team that can actually implement a plan. Yeah. The board they can kick out any time as long as they've got a, a, a management team that can execute. I think that's going to be the critical component. Yeah. One comment after having many boards is that uh, prepare. I hated to prepare the monthly board book when we had monthly meetings early on in startup, but it provided a way to bring the company together. So we'd have to look at each of our projections and then match the projections to actual, and that was useful to communicate throughout the company where we where we were and also it was a chance to get my people up in front of the board and a lot of them hadn't been used to talking in front of groups and so they had to defend what they were doing and so it was very good for team building for them and then the people who weren't in the board meeting we share all the board results that friday at our little beer fest and go over what the board said and where we were and what changes we might have to make and give them a view what was going on and so it can be a very useful, yeah. uh, if, if painful, to put together all the material, yeah. but it can be very useful for the whole company. And so it's very coalescing to have right. that point in time and get to review all the, the yeah. in critical elements. Just a quick segue to add on to that is, one, in my experience, one of my board members of my three outside directors was coming from the East Coast, from New York, 
So he would fly in the night before and we would have dinner, right? And we'd have dinner the night before and talk about what we were gonna talk about and kind of catch up and whatever. And then to your point, the, the board meeting went a lot smoother because they were all ready to go and knew what was happening. And one other comment, when we had all these board votes when we went to sell the company and the buyer had to do the due diligence, they requisitioned all those board votes right. mm -hmm. and they looked through them. And by having a complete board vote, showing exactly what Thanks for adding that. I, just one more thing, someone else mentioned the regularity of the board meetings and having a cadence, a cadence and a continuity so that in the first one it's reviewing last year's KPIs. The second one it's looking at initiatives for this year. The third one of the year it's doing the strategic plan and the fourth one it's approving the budget. So it has this cadence of board meetings and kind of a theme of each one of them so that people on the staff could prepare for that. And then you put your staff, you get staff all of a sudden to be very professional, all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, I, and I, I can't remember if it's like every year, bring your staff in to, to present. Here's here's what happened since the last board meeting, right? What was the other? second of those four things? KPIs. Oh, in that case, his, his cadence was KPIs from the last year, and then initiatives for this year, how are they going? And then a strategic plan, which would be more of the longer term, one, two, three year kind of thing that was put together by the staff, but approved by the board on the third meeting. And the fourth meeting was an approval of the budget, which staff had put together and brought in the approval for the next year. Yeah, it's up to you, but just a suggestion. Mm -hmm. During the course of the words. Mm -hmm. You got a question? One more? Yes. Uh, between a board fiduciary board and an advisory board mm -hmm. yes and, and some people don't even call it advisory board because it's advisory committee because yeah it's not necessarily sure yeah. board of advisors or group of advisors sure mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it what are your thoughts on that and also what are your comments on that well there's some right there's some regulations and obligations of directors that are not the case of advisors and so it's a it's almost a fiduciary difference um, advisors are, you're, you know, I've got an advisor who's been there, done that, and I have coffee with them once a month, and a board of directors is much more formal, um, it has uh, pros and legal obligation to them. And typically outlined in the bylaws. Yeah. Yeah. To, to your question, that was that, what the role of the board of directors is. And then the board of advisors, look at them as more operational. I mean, if you want to look at it from 50,000 feet, your board is much more strategic. Your advisory board is much more operational. And individuals are, are, are helping run the group. So. Board directors also are fiduciaries in that they have to operate in the best interest of the company. Right. And if they don't, they can actually be held legally responsible, whereas advisors just give you advice. Right. Good point. Yeah. Good point. With the disclaimer. Oh, nice and <laughs> Well, thank you very yeah. much for thank your you guys. attention. Thank you, guys. Fill out your little sheet and, uh, and uh, so we get paid. Hey, how are you? Good, 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 good to see you. Good, 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 Hey Rosie, yeah. have we worked with high school students? We have, I have. Yeah. Um, Don't leave home before you.
I mean, don't leave without talking for the okay? They just disappear. No, I'm just throwing one. There is, but it's, it's, it's going to take you over. Yeah. 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 Yeah.